I am Yi Tao, product manager from an Ant Financial. Most of the time is spent with customers working on cloud native products. And this is Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name, my name is Kevin, and I am an engineer from Ant Financial. I mainly focus on cloud native related technologies. Okay, today, our, together we are going to introduce the serverless platform our team has been working on. It supports large scale applications. Before we get started, I'd like to ask two quick questions. First, how many of you have used serverless for a POC or demo in cloud? Please raise your hands. Quite a lot. So how, how many of you have used that in production? Please raise your hands. I saw fewer hands. So serverless evolving very, very fast. If you take a look at the projects listed in the CNCF landscape for serverless, you will be surprised at its progress. Why is serverless so attractive? We already have containers, Kubernetes, and so many cool features. What makes the difference? In my opinion, serverless attracts me for the three reasons. The first is that it takes care of the infrastructure that we no longer need to worry about, only focus on the business logic. Second is that it supports scale to zero when there's no workload. And the cold start time is really fast when the new traffic come, comes in again. The third is that we can divide the applications into pieces and it supports to de uh, deploy from code, from uh, code package, or even from image. This is, uh, allow us to divide the application into pieces and uh, merge them with work workflows to, be mute, to build a big, larger uh, application. Because of these advantages, serverless is useful in some use cases in real world. First, for public cloud, it is suitable for de individual developers and small teams because they want to get things started as fast as possible. And they want the workload to scale to zero to save the cost. It's also suitable for some industry cloud an industry cloud is some company or organizations that build this platform to share the infrastructures and resources to other partners. So they won't have to build the infrastructure again. Instead, they can collaborate and build up layer applications. Serverless can help to reduce the cost to the minimize. On-premise customers also find serverless useful. First, you can imagine that the company is doing some marketing campaigns that are time critical. Before that, the operation teams will have to provide the machines and they will estimate the number. But if the consumption goes beyond that number, they will cause some online problems. If that goes down lower than the number, it means that there will be some waste of the resource. Also, some companies are running big data and machine learning tasks. As you know, those tasks always require machines that have better performance. With serverless, they can scale to zero when those tasks are not running. Those resources can be saved for other workload. Also, it provides a new way to transform our monolithic applications to elastic applications. For those legacy apps, it's difficult to turn it into microservice or dog cries. We can, we can gradually divide them and select those functionalities, build them, rebuild them with functions, APIs, workflows, gradually turn them into elastic application. Yet yeah, despite we have so, although we have those uh, use cases, we still find some problems when we're trying to build a serverless platform. These are the key problems we like to share from our experience. The first concern is the performance. So far as I know, running Knative on Kubernetes takes a lot of long time for the code start, and it even gets worse when the cluster scales. Second is the cost. 
as a maintainer of the platform, you still have to take care of each layer of serverless and its dependencies for Mesh and Kubernetes. It means sometimes you will even have to pay for the nodes that are not in use. Last but not least, security. The default Docker runtime, also known as Doc Run C, is prone to escapes. Yes. So we have all these key problems. And uh, later on, I'll, this time I will hand over to Kevin to share our attempts to address them. Yes, thank you. So in this session today, we are going to share with you how we tackle of some of the above mentioned problems at Ant Financial and some of our hardened experiences when we are trying to build a serverless platform. We are going to elaborate on how to boost the performance of Knative, drastically cut the code start latency, and then we are going to talk about how to reduce the cost of running a serverless platform. Finally, we will take a look at how to scale the serverless platform horizontally and uh, solve the problems that arise when we run a serverless platform at scale. First, let's talk about performance. As some of you may already know, when the Kubernetes cluster gets larger and larger, its performance deteriorates. I have done some uh, tests. So with a Kubernetes cluster of about 1,000 nodes, it actually takes a long time for the scheduling process to finish. On average, it would take about 10 seconds to schedule a pod to a node. And then there is like Docker image pull, there is container startup, there is waiting for the container readiness probe to be ready, and finally there is registering the pod to the service mesh. Altogether, it can take about 20 seconds. So 20 seconds for the pod to start. 20 seconds is totally unacceptable for an individual's website. As mentioned just now, the key value will be the, uh, the code start time is very fast. But if a pod takes like 20, 20 seconds to start, most of the times users will find his service is, cannot be visited. So the user experience must be very bad. Yes, just imagine if a user waits for 20 seconds um, before the website even starts loading. That is unacceptable, right? And the programmer uh, not wanting this to happen maybe will configure the server serverless platform to, to always keep at least one replica and to never scale to zero. Uh, by doing so, um, they actually defy the purpose of serverless because now they cannot get the benefit of scaling to zero, and uh, they will still be charged even if nobody is going to use their service. Exactly. Yeah, so that is going to be a deal breaker, and uh, our engineer team must solve this problem. So we actually came up with a very creative idea to solve this problem, and uh, as far as I know, this is an original idea. How do we do that? We use something called a pod pool. What is pod pool? It's like we just uh, start up 20 to 100 pods, uh, or another number. Yeah, we just start up some pods and let them sit there without doing anything. And uh, when the serverless platform demands the creation of a new pod, instead of starting up a pod from scratch, we look into the pod pool and uh, find one of the pods that, that is in the ready state, that is in a standby state and ready to be used and we then adopt that pod and inject the user code into that pod so as to run the user code. Um, by doing this, we can effectively skip the, the cost of like scheduling a pod or, or registering a pod to the service mesh, et cetera. We can save a lot of time. It's actually blazing fast. Yeah, just generally speaking, uh, pod pool uh, is just like uh, any, any other, other resource, res pools. resource pools we have used in daily life, like pools of, uh, for database connections, thread pools. So they have been proven to enhance the performance. So basically, pod pool works in the same way. So, so far as we know that there is no like um, community project on this part, so we start this idea and uh, uh, implement from scratch. Yes, we had to implement this idea from scratch, mixing, uh, mixing the object pool pattern and the Kubernetes pods. 
how do we implement it? I'm going to give the details here. So the first thing that you are going to do is that you define your CRDs. You create two, two CRDs for this task. What we are actually doing here is trying to add a new type of workload to Kubernetes. So um, I think that the name of our CRD should conform to what Kubernetes already has to provide. So everybody knows that Kubernetes has got deployment and the replica set. Uh, let's just call our custom resource serverless deployment and the serverless replica set. Uh, not only should the name be similar, uh, the specs should also be very similar to the original Kubernetes workloads because what we are actually trying to do is to fork their code and only modify some of the behaviors. So uh, after we are done with defining the CRDs, the next step is to do some coding. We can just fork the controller manager from Kubernetes. For those of you who do not know, uh, controller manager is a Kubernetes component a control plan component that reconciles or handles the, re, uh, the deployment or replica set resource in Kubernetes. And uh, for example, it creates pods when uh, it finds out that uh, the replicas, the, the wanted replicas in the replica set uh, is less than the actual replica. So we just fork its code and uh, we change one of its behavior. The, uh, the behavior that we change is that instead of sending a post request to the API server to create a pod from scratch, we now let it send a get request to the API server with a label selector to find out about all the standby pods and uh, uh, pick one of the pod in that list according to our policy and uh, adopt that pod to run the user code, basically to inject the user code into that running pod. Well, the last part, the, the injecting the user code into the running pod is the interesting one. How are, how are we going to do that? There are some possible ways. Well, the first one is the easiest one. We can use something called a code loader. So, so what is a code loader? A code loader is a program whose sole purpose is to uh, like sit in the container and uh, wait for instructions from the outside. Uh, it can uh, get instructions from the outside and uh, know where to download the code. And after it's done downloading the code, it will execute the code. Uh, so when the controller wants to inject, uh, for example, uh, a jar file into a running container, it can just send an HTTP request or like send a gRPC request to the code loader to inform the code loader about the URL of the uh, user code package. Then the code loader will just download the image and execute it. Then the user program will be up and running. Well, some of you may say that uh, uh, this is not a cloud native way to do things because we are using HTTP requests and RPCs. Uh, we should be uh, using declarative uh, ways to, to do things, right? I agree. So maybe we can uh, leverage another feature from Kubernetes, that is the downward API. One of the feature, one of the feature of downward API is that it can map the annotations of a pod to a file that sits, that stays in a container. So when the controller wants to uh, notify the code loader of the URL, it just updates the pods annotation. It just writes the URL into that pods annotation. And then the file in the container will change. The code loader will watch for changes of that file in the container uh, using mechanisms like inotify. And uh, when it has found out that the, the, the content has changed, it will read the content, get the URL, and do things just like the old way. Okay, sounds good, but actually there's a limitation to this method, is that now we limit the users to running code packages such as .jar files. So what if the user doesn't want to run code packages, but instead they want to run the images? Um, so we got to figure out some other ways. Well, one possible way and the one easy way is to use maybe ephemeral container. Ephemeral containers is a quite new Kubernetes feature that allows the pod to run a new container uh, without restarting the pod or without recreating a pod. So basically, your, uh, the controller can just inject a new container into a running pod and the container will start. 
However, this is actually not the recommended way to use ephemeral containers, and there are many side effects, so this solution is no good. Uh, what we do here at Ant Financial is that uh, we forked and we modified the, the code of Kubelet, which is the node daemon that runs on every uh, Kubernetes worker, um, to allow the dynamic substitution of containers at runtime. So, uh, after we uh, modify this code, uh, uh, the kubelet will get informed of the spec change of the container. And uh, when he sees that the container spec has changed, it will, it will just uh, kill the old container and uh, start a new container and uh, add the container back to that pod. Again, um, some of you may consider this a bad practice because um, the community edition of Kubernetes cannot do this, right? Um, but as far as I am concerned, I think I, we are not directly providing a Kubernetes service to the end user. We are just trying to build a service platform on top of Kubernetes. So I think that may be a, a good solution because uh, this is a solution with the least side effect. Uh, your mileage may vary again. <laughs> okay, another important aspect of pod pool is the size of the pool. Why it is so important? You can imagine that if the size goes too large, it means that it's large beyond the consumption, so it costs the waste. And if size goes too small, it will function like a cache miss. It means that most of the time, the controller will not be able to schedule the workload into a ready pod. So the, the size is really important. How we achieve this? We designed an algorithm that automatically adjusts the size according to the usage. This usage is calculated from the parsed windows. So in, the, in each parsed time windows, we'll get the average number of the uh, esti estimated number for the pod in each past time windows. And for this moment, we'll get the average of the past time windows. So a good algorithm will turn out the results shown as shown in this picture. As you can see, there are two lines. The green one shows the size of the container pool while the blue one shows the consumptions. You can see that these two lines are very close, meaning that the size of the pool is, is like, of, like all the time it covers consumptions, but at the same time, minimize the waste. Okay, so after all these optimizations for the performance, we like show the results we have achieved here for a simple Java HTTP server application. The code start time from, uh, goes down from 20 minutes to 1.8 min, min, uh, seconds. It's a surprisingly 90% improvement. Uh, imagine uh, individual developers running a website and he, find, he or she finds it only takes two seconds to load the web page. He will be uh, more likely to give serverless a try. Yes, I was also very pleased with the result that we were able to achieve. And uh, let's think about some other applications, some other use cases about this pod pool thing. I have listed a few here, like service mesh, microservices, or frameworks that takes a long time to start, or services that require to download a lot of data before it can be started. I think that, generally speaking, uh, any system that requires a long time to pre-warm can benefit from such an approach. And that is why I do think that this pod pull pattern can be very useful. I believe that with this thing, uh, Kubernetes, the, the applications running on Kubernetes, they can not only be reliable and uh, observable, but they can also be very performant. That is why I think maybe someday we should set up like a special, a special interest group to, to formalize things and uh, to push this idea further. I believe it is going to be beneficial to the community and to everyone, yeah. Okay, next we are going to talk the problem about cost reduction. As you know, Knative is a collection of deployments running on Kubernetes. It contains uh, a lot of components like 
as shown here, like Knative controllers, activator, uh, autoscaler. It also has a dependencies for, for mesh, it's, it's still, and uh, ingress gateway for Kubernetes, like Kubernetes control manager, something like that. The problem here is that all, both the uh, Knative component and the dependencies are very costly. It will take a lot of resources to run this. If in a multi-turnant environment, the things even get worse. So countless cores and gigabytes of memories will be used, uh, used to host the platform. Yes. And sometimes they are not in use. Yes, countless cores are used, but they produce no real value because no real user application is running on that, right? So how do we solve this problem? To solve this problem, we need to flip the model, flip the architecture. And after we flip the model, it becomes like this. Now, there is a shared Kubernetes cluster, and there is going to be a shared set of Knative components running on that shared Kubernetes cluster. And then there are going to be many, many, many tenants. And uh, now the only thing that a tenant does is to create his or her own Knative app. And then the shared Knative controller will get notified of that new app and uh, reconcile that new app and uh, do everything just the old way. Well, in, in this approach, uh, there will be basically no additional cost of adding one more tenant to the whole system because now the cost is only going to be proportional to the number of apps that are created in the platform and the uh, replicas of each app. So how do we achieve multi-tenancy or how do we allow multiple users to share one single Kubernetes cluster without interfering each other? There are, again, two ways to do this. So the first way is the easiest and the most practiced way. It is name-based uh, sorry, namespace-based isolation. To put it simply, we just create one namespace for one tenant and set up the RBAX so that the tenant will only have access to his or her own namespace and uh, no privilege to access the namespaces for, of other tenants. Well, I, uh, to be honest, I have to say that this approach is sufficient for most use cases, and uh, it should be enough, but at End Financial, we have pushed the idea of multi-tenancy further by implementing a fully multi-tenant Kubernetes. We do this by adding an extra layer of directory to the etcd, which is a storage engine that is behind the Kubernetes. And uh, we just uh, store the data of each tenant to that extra directory, to, to their own directory, right? And uh, by doing this, we can achieve, we can make a fully multi-tenant uh, uh, Kubernetes so that everything can be isolated and uh, supposed multi-tenant. But there are a lot of technical details here which I'm not going to cover in this talk. Okay, let's move on to the next stage. You Slide. will also have other ways to reduce the cost uh, you can choose to use a class autoscaler provided by Kubernetes and set the scaling rules. It will do the release and uh, uh, provision nodes by itself. And you can also choose virtual kubelet along with uh, cloud services uh, that is provides on-demand container uh, like Alibaba Elastic Container Instance. Yes, yes. So whether you are using a container on demand service or whether you are just using Elastic Computing Service, you can save the costs because when you are using their service, you are actually sharing a very, very big resource pool with all the other customers. So the more you share, the less the waste and so the lower the costs, right? Mm -hmm. But there is catch here. Uh, since uh, containers are easy to use and fast, can easily be integrated into our systems, but uh, security is a potential problem here. Uh, since they share the same Linux kernel and uh, uh, it may cause some uh, security issues like uh, if one malicious containers take over the host that it will uh, damage, cause damage to the other containers, uh, contain, uh, tenants containers. So, uh, what we are going to approach this problem is that we are going to uh, use Kata containers. Uh, Kata containers takes a different way of address this, is that behind each pod 
it is not actually continuous, but it's, it's lightweight VMs. It looks like and feels like containers, but provide strong isolations. So with Kata containers, uh, since it's not sharing the Linux kernel, so it makes it difficult uh, for any escapes and attacks. Okay, so with the security issues, issues addressed, we are going to move on to the last part of our presentation today, which is cluster at scale. So as we are serving more and more serverless applications, the workload, uh, the load on our control plane gets higher and higher, right? Uh, at first, we can try to just add more CPU cores and uh, more gigabytes of memory to address this problem. But finally, uh, one day, we will hit the ceiling where we can no more add more cores to a single machine. So we have to figure out a way to allow the serverless platform to scale out horizontally instead of vertically. Uh, how do we do that? We use a technique called sharding. What sharding basically means is that you divide the whole workload into many, many, many small partitions, and you assign each partition to a set of control plan, and let that control plan take charge of that partition. So uh, that control plan will only like uh, take charge of like 1% one, 1 of the total workload, that should be fine, right? And the, if the workload continues growing, we can always add more partitions and uh, more control plan sets. Yeah, that's how basically sharding, that's basically how sharding works. To, to implement it in Kubernetes and Knative, we have to do many things. Well, the first thing is that we gotta have an upstream system. An upstream system needs to assign a shard ID to the Knative application that the user has created. How to choose the shard ID? It actually doesn't matter. It can be based on the user ID or on the application ID, tenant ID. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as the shard ID um, stays like uh, as long as it is even across all the Knative applications. That should be fine. And uh, the second step is that we must modify the controller to, to allow the partitioning of controllers. Um, that is to say, the controller in each uh, control plan set must only acknowledge and uh, process the workloads or the resources with the same partition ID. It should not be able to uh, know about the workloads in other partitions. Otherwise, when we are ru running them uh, at the same time, one set of control plan will affect the other sets of control plans. We cannot do that, okay? And uh, the third thing that we're going to do is to um, take care of the uh, data plan uh, problems. So as some of you may know, uh, Knative has got uh, some data plan components. Mm -hmm. For example, there is queue proxy and uh, there is activator. Those data plan components, they send the metrics to the control plan, which is like autoscaler. And um, how is the data plan component supposed to know uh, to which control plan component should it send the HTTP request? Here, we are going to use the DNS to solve this problem. We are going to set up multiple DNS domains, each with a suffix. You know, the suffix can just be the partition ID. And we are going to add A names to that DNS so that that domain is going to point to the control plan component of that partition. And uh, now the data plan components only need to do a DNS resolution to find out which IP address it should visit. Uh, that takes care of the problems that uh, arises in the data plan. And finally, we're going to talk about service mesh. Uh, in service mesh, uh, to prevent data from growing exponentially, we're going to use a feature called the service group. So a service group basically divides the whole service mesh into many sub meshes and the applications in a sub-mesh can only see applications, see the other applications in the sub-mesh. It cannot see uh, the ap applications from, say, say another uh, sub-mesh. Uh, this way, the, the sidecar proxy uh, that is a part of the service mesh only needs to manage a very limited amount of data, and uh, the performance can also be better, too. So that about concludes how we are going to make the, the serverless platform able to scale out horizontally. But, 
oh sorry, yeah, let's uh, take a closer look at uh, how we can implement um, like controller sharding. So how do we do controller sharding and make controller only uh, see the, the resources, the workloads that are of the same partition ID? Actually, this is very, very easy. Thanks to the magic of uh, Kubernetes label selector. The only thing that we need to do is that we add a label selector to the informer of that container, to, to the informer that the container, uh, the controller uses. And uh, automatically, the controller will only see the resources that matches that label and ignore any other resource that doesn't match the label. So maybe there's just uh, five lines of code and uh, controller uh, partitioning is done. So that basically, uh, that basically explains how we are going to make the serverless platform uh, able to scale out horizontally. Um, if we scale out uh, a lot of uh, the control plan uh, components, then someday maybe Kubernetes itself is going to be the bottleneck. When that happens, we, don't, we do not need to panic. We just need to deploy yeah, spin up some more Kubernetes clusters and assign some of the partitions to the new Kubernetes clusters, right? It, it just acts as a higher level of partitioning, yes. Yes, so generally speaking, like scaling a serverless cluster uh, will be easy if the upstream system takes, well takes the uh, partition and uh, uh, sharding. So uh, that's a key, take key, key takeaways from our talk today. So first, uh, pre-warm and uh, uh, pod pool te techniques uh, can largely enhance the performance to run Kubernetes, to run K-native on Kubernetes. And uh, its standardization uh, may be benefited to the ecosystem. Second is that serverless is, is about sharing the infrastructures. The more we share, the less it costs. And uh, third is that using sharding and uh, partition uh, it can effectively address uh, problems caused when the serverless cluster gets scaled out. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you want to learn more about our team, you can take a look at the following links. Uh, the first is that a cloud service our team has been working on is in preview status. And uh, we also uh, work on an open source project called SofaStack for financial customers and you can find the GitHub link and the homepage introduction on the following two links. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for having us here. So any questions? We will take questions. We still have like five minutes for questions, I guess. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the question is, how many pods? How many services are uh -huh. in one in your deployment? Uh -huh. deployment? I see. The question is, how many services are uh, class deployments? Cluster deployments? So you mean how many? Oh, how many services are there in our clusters? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Could you share that number? Uh, <laughs> Are we supposed to? <laughs> we, maybe this number we, we are not supposed to like uh, share here. It's related to the uh, to the business. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. You please. Uh, the Apache project called what? Uh, openness. Openness. Yeah. Open whisk. Open oh, whisk. Open whisk. Okay, you are referring to open whisk. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes, quite similar concepts, actually. Uh, but uh, we are actually working on Knative. So we are building our uh, serverless platform uh, on top of Knative and uh, trying to do the optimizations there. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, there are going to be some similarities uh, between uh, all the implementations. But you know, Knative is uh, like a, a, a new serverless platform or a new standards for serverless. 
So, so uh, yeah, we, we just try to adopt that as our uh, like a baseline and uh, build our products upon Knative. Yeah, I, I know OpenWhisk is a very great product, but uh, uh, it only integrates with uh, Kubernetes. It is not really uh, like Kubernetes native. Um, and um, I, I think Knative mainly deals with like uh, functional uh, uh, workload, right? So, so um, maybe they cannot deal with like uh, custom images. So I, I do believe that there are similarities, but there are also many differences between these two technologies. Yeah. Uh, does that answer your question or? Yeah, concepts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, maybe OpenWhisk only uh, allows the injection of like uh, code packages, which is the like the first kind of workload that we mentioned uh, about, right? So um, when we are trying to build our product upon Knative, we try to uh, like support more kinds of workloads, like uh, uh, custom images. And uh, that's the effort that we are making, and uh, maybe that has some difference. That, um, uh, yeah, maybe that's the difference from the open whisk. Okay, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, when we do the service mesh partitioning, uh, it's actually that we put the applications of the same tenant into the same sub mesh so that uh, um, the, the applications of the same user will be able to like, see each other, but they will not be able to see the, the services that are run by the other users. And uh, if they would like to uh, see the uh, services run by the other users, they must like use the public IP or, or some other mechanisms. And um, also, we, we just set up one ingress gateway for each sub mesh. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Okay, uh, one maybe one last question. Yeah. Yes, namespace based isolation, yes. Pardon? Subservice mesh. Actually, uh, they are all partitioning techniques, but they are not the same thing. Uh, namespace isolation is basically uh, like uh, multi tenancy or isolation that is done at the Kubernetes level, Kubernetes control plan level. Uh, while uh, service mesh uh, sub meshing is like uh, uh, multi tenancy that is done on the service mesh level. So they are happening at the different levels, but uh, they are all concepts of like dividing the whole thing into many small groups and uh, yeah, just uh, uh, partitioning the workloads. Exactly. It's not zero, you mean? Uh, so the pod pool is not? We will estimate the number of the pod pool, the size of the pod pool, according to the average usage in past time windows. So if like no traffic goes in, the average will be zero, then the pool, the size of the pool goes to zero. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any more no questions? questions? Thanks. Thanks.